I'm nearly convinced John Kirkpatrick to make his entrance out of a cupboard. <laughs> because I always <laughs> try and cook my dinner after sound check, but before the gig starts. <laughs> Never yeah. any other time. In the Kareem Polewalk gig, um, there was a spontaneous raffle run by members of the audience uh, in the interval. <laughs> we don't quite, don't quite know how it happened. It's the 23rd of March 2020 and Prime Minister Boris Johnson announces the first lockdown in the UK. A stay-at-home order is in place and, with the exception of a handful of key worker professions, nobody may leave their home for work. So where did that leave over 50,000 professional musicians whose livelihoods rely pretty heavily on personal contact? On the whole, it was cancelled gigs and online teaching, but fortunately, the team at Folk Weekend Oxford had other ideas. I, uh, last year, was getting ready to run Folk Weekend Oxford, which happens in the third weekend in April. And uh, then we went into lockdown about four and a half weeks before the festival happened. I basically just uh, was trying to work out how we could still do stuff. And I had this, I'd used Zoom before as a conferencing thing. So I just had this sort of idea of, well, you know, why couldn't we, why couldn't we put music through it? And surely that would work. So I phoned up Pete and said, I've had this idea. Do you think it could work? We didn't have any kind of tech set up as a festival. We just relied on whatever the artists had at their disposal. So a lot of that was spent kind of having lots of conversations with what people could beg, borrow and steal or what they had and how, what the best setup with that was. And we still did all the sound checks and everything, but it was kind of me saying, try plugging this in there. Why don't you move that one microphone that you've got a little bit so we can get the balances better between your voice and the guitar or whatever. It was kind of, there was a lot of, a lot of that going on. Um, it was right festival, at the start it? of the first lockdown. So everybody was just in the house, not allowed to go anywhere, not allowed to see anyone. So, you know, Pete was posting microphones out to people, but then it just, it went really well. The festival itself went really well. And we sold more tickets than we've ever sold for any festival before. And we had lovely, lovely feedback from the audience saying what a difference it had made to their lockdown. And to the artists as well, were just so grateful to not have all the gigs cancelled um, and to be able to play. And so we kind of said, well, do you think we should keep doing this? So we did, we did a few more. And then Pete said to me one day, oh, do you know what would be amazing? This is what I'd love to do is if we just bought this sound desk and then we just sent it out to them and then I could do all the mixing from here. And I was like, yeah, let's do it. So we just, it just kind of grew from there really. And then here we are doing two gigs a week. Within about six months, Live to Your Living Room had become its own entity with a busy concert schedule. The team now posts a sound desk and laptop out to artists who plug in as if for an in-person gig and have the show mixed by a sound engineer somewhere in the UK. But was this vision there in some way at the beginning or was it a little more serendipitous? It's funny when you talk about um, a vision because early on it was very much, why don't we just say anyone who wants to do a gig can do a gig? Like, and that was kind of the prerequisite. If you, if you want to have a go at it, that's totally fine. I mean, I would just check that they were good. I didn't, I didn't just book anybody. <laughs> and then I guess, so for the first six months of it all, we were running under the Folk Weekend Oxford banner still. And then from kind of September onwards, we went as live to your living room as its own entity that just Kat and I were running between us. And I suppose at that point we started to, kind of visualise the future of it all a bit more, more and how we would kind of see ourselves. We started to view ourselves as essentially like any other art centre. And with that, we've talked a lot as we go about the kind of responsibility of programmers to um, not just book the people that sell all of the tickets. It's a, it is a bit of a constant battle because we're always trying to work out the best ways to keep everything financially stable because obviously as, as we keep growing, our costs are increasing and increasing. So there is a, there is a pressure to, um, to be making a certain amount of money, but yet also keep that responsibility of giving up and coming the opportunity. Uh, so it's, that's definitely part of, part of our ongoing conversation all of the time. I think the, yeah, um, the, the parallel you draw with of an art center is really nice there actually because that's that's one thing that we noticed from our gig is it was it did feel very art center-esque in the fact that we had our regular followers there who might turn up to your gigs a lot of the time and support you wherever and then equally like an art center you seem to have built up this regular fan base that will turn up every week to a gig which is really really refreshing to see yeah it's it's amazing we have a, a small group of people who have been to almost every single gig that we've put on bearing in mind yeah. that we've put on we've been putting on two a week for months now and it's been it's it's been brilliant kind of building up the relationships with the audience as well um 
as the artist over the last few months and just kind of seeing the same faces and um you know the audience kind of feeling back to us and we know you know there's particular people who've been shielding or um have been been housebound during lockdown and have been able to stay in touch because of what we've been doing the image of a virtual arts centre is one that captures life to your living room perfectly, especially when you consider the range of art forms that they've embraced in recent months, from a May Day dance at dawn through to comedy nights and spoken word. But building this impressive reputation, this art centre in the ether must have come with its fair share of challenges. Like, can you really get gig quality sound over Zoom? So on the technical side of things, I guess, yeah, we're constantly trying to improve what it is that we're doing. And for it's a really fine line between um improving what we're doing but how much i give the artists to do as a job because what i've always been trying to do is make sure we can get the best possible quality sound uh whilst also not freaking out artists who are already nervous about doing a show that is significantly different to how they would normally do it so that's been kind of one side of it is kind of getting it to a point where it's quite a straightforward system, uh, you know, no matter the technical background of the artist and no matter what equipment they have, we can make it work typically, but also comes with that like constant zoom changes. You know, we, in the early days, we had a system when you used to be able to mute and unmute as the host, any, any audience member that made things really easy for us. Um, little things like that have kind of been constantly on ongoing issues and then um actually the, the the one big thing is um is the quality of the internet at the at the artist end and um, we've had a couple of shockers where it's been awful quality and but i would just... say in the grand scheme of the amount that we've done i if you told me this time last year you're going to do however many gigs we've done a good couple of hundred i would imagine and you'd say that probably less than 10 of those were really bad for the internet and probably only two or three have had someone, an artist completely disappear, then I would have thought that was pretty good going at that stage. With the speed that this venue has grown and the sheer number, quality and variety of gigs they've put on, it would have been easy to focus on the things that were hard. But what about those more positive and defining moments in the journey? And besides that, a window into the front room of your audience, what they're having for dinner, their six dogs or mad toddler, must have led to some pretty memorable moments. I've got so many incredible memories over the last year. There's so many little things that have become a, a, a joy. So there's one particular audience member who comes to literally everything and so any we have um the crew have a, a whatsapp chat going and we've got to the stage now where whenever we see this particular person turn up somebody will write it in the chat and go oh they're here they're here um and we get like stupidly excited about it um and we're, we're all so invested in whatever pete is cooking for dinner um because that's that's always part of the sound check and um, because i always <laughs> like, try and cook my dinner after sound check but before the gig starts <laughs> never yeah. any other time it's little things like that have been lovely but then just being able to kind of connect with the artists and you know like I, one of my favorite memories is the time when i'm nearly convinced john kirkpatrick to make his entrance out of a cupboard and the artists who surprise you like there's a few who i've booked I, you know i know they're good um and i'm but i'm not really you know, I'm thinking, oh, you know, it's going to be, it's going to be good. It's going to be fine. I'll, I'll just do a bit of work while, while they're performing. And then you get so drawn in. So the last time that happened to me was with Atlas, which is um, a, an Irish duo, and they're absolutely stunning. And I hadn't expected to get so captured by it. And, and that was just amazing. That was, you know, that moment of where you kind of, you, you find yourself just drawn in. Uh, I don't want to go on about loads of these, but also Sam Sweeney's gig is a good, uh, a real one as well, because that was the first, one of the first times that, that really saw like genuine emotion out of an artist when that first round of applause comes in after the first number, there was a proper kind yeah. of taken aback moment. I love watching that when the artist isn't expecting it to feel like a real gig. And then you see that moment where it kind of clicks and they're like, oh my, oh, I can hear the people applauding. I can see, this is incredible. And it's, it's just absolutely lovely to watch. It's so rewarding. And I remember during Sam's gig, there was a young guy, I think he must be kind of late teens um, and he had a cello. And at one point he was like just below Sam and there was Sam playing away. And he was there like totally just in the zone playing along with Sam on his cello. But you just couldn't do that in a, in a venue. You, you couldn't just rock up with your, with your melody and kind of join in with Martin Carthy, could you? So it's, it's, a, it's another way that, 
you know, the, the Zoom gigs, they're different, but they're, they're kind of their own thing. They're not, they, they've evolved into something that isn't just a substitute for an in-person gig. They've evolved into something that is their own individual thing. They're not the same as, as in-person gigs, but they're not less. So do the unique benefits of a Zoom gig mean it's something that could continue beyond the pandemic? And how might a digital date stand up alongside regular tour dates? There's certainly an appetite for online gigs at the moment, but as we begin to approach something resembling normality, the desire to be in the same room as the musicians will surely come out on top. I've had a lot of emails from audience members saying, please don't stop doing this. Um, for, for all sorts of reasons for, you know, I live in the middle of nowhere and no artists ever come anywhere near me, or I've got young children or, or whatever. And I think the, the amazing response from, from people who've seen so much more music live over this last year than they have done before, um, has been incredible. So we're, we're hoping that artists are going to want to offer digital dates as part of their in-venue tour dates. So we've got an artist who's, who's booked a, a national tour um, all over the UK and one of their dates is a digital date with us, which is going to be an exclusively online date. And um, I'm really pleased about that. I'm really pleased that it's being seen as, a, as an equivalent and as something that can just kind of stand up alongside other venue dates. We're also looking at things like um, whether we can partner with with small venues um, who would normally not be able to afford to get a, a bigger name artist in, and whether we can perhaps look at um, you know adding a digital element to that to sell more tickets and, and help to sort of put towards the cost of that. Um, but the other thing I've been thinking about recently, I've been in, involved in Esperance, which is this, this relatively new movement for gender minorities in the folk arts. And um, one of the things that I think could be really beneficial um, is that we could help working parents kind of get back into gigging after having taken some time off to have a child because being able to to do a live stream but in a supported way in a structured way with with us providing the infrastructure rather than you having to just do your own live streaming with your own mics and wondering if it's sounding okay and that kind of thing then that actually could be quite a good stepping stone to support new parents kind of getting back out into work and back out into gigging. I think there's um, the scope the same scope in with some of the older artists as well like I'm just mm. thinking the Bob Fox gig that we did he was quite vocal about um about not being overly keen about going back on the road and late night driving and all of those kinds of things as he as he gets older and um yeah. if you'd if you told him four years ago that he'd be able to do a gig from his house it'd have jumped at the chance that kind of thing i think there's definitely <laughs> some scope some scope for that kind of thing as well i think so too and you know like the the martin carthys and the john kirkpatrick's and um, you know, they've still got so much energy and vitality in their playing and they still want to be out there and playing to people. But the, the fact is a life on the road is exhausting and it, and it's hard, really hard. So if we can just be a, be a bit of a help in that so that people don't have to do it as much, then, you know, that could be, could be really good. So, it looks as though Live to Your Living Room are here to stay, and with a full programme of events running into the summer, there's still plenty of time to get involved as an audience member or as a volunteer steward via the links on the screen. <laughs>